Good morning to our online congregation, and I welcome those of you who are new. Good morning to everyone who's here with us in person. Before we get going, I want to share the scripture that Sister Kimberly put on her envelope. It is, pleasant words are like a honeycomb, sweet and delightful to the soul and healing to the body. Proverbs 16, 24. And that's what God's word is to us. It's sweet. It's like a honeycomb, especially when we love God's word and we're living righteous lives and we're obeying his word. Then his word is sweet to us. You can go over to the book of Revelation where John is given a book to eat up the words of it because he's going to speak them out and he's told that they're going to be sweet in his mouth. But once they hit his belly, it was sour to him because he was going to be having to say hard things, right? So we praise God for the sweetness of his word, just like a honeycomb. God bless you, Sister Kimberly. Thank you for sending that in. We are on New Age, part 15. Biblical, I'm going to talk about biblical meditation. We're finally, I'm finally going to address what biblical meditation is. And I'm also going to talk about transcendental meditation in public schools. So here we go. Let's take a look at what the Bible says about godly meditation. Let's find out what does godly meditation look like? What is it? So that we can have a clear mind and understand that. And we can tell the difference between biblical meditation and worldly, new age meditation, right? So this next passage of scripture is God speaking to Joshua after the death of Moses. And now Joshua is going to rise up and be the leader of the Israelites. So let's go here to Joshua 1.8. This book of the law shall not depart out of your mouth, but you shall meditate therein day and night, that you may observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then you shall make your way prosperous, and then you shall have good success. Now, this was the Old Testament law. Joshua was to study it. He was to speak it. He was to practice it in his daily life and not forget it. And by always speaking it and doing it, living it, it's part of him. He would be known as someone who, med who, who reads, studies, meditates, you know, on God's law. He lives it out in his life. Anybody could look at his life and watch him and know he lives according to God's law. He speaks his law. He thinks about his law. He meditates on it. He lives it, right? So by always speaking it and doing it, it would not depart out of his mouth because he would keep it active in his life. He would always be talking about it. He would be saying it in prayer. He would be standing on God's word. It's not going to depart out of his mouth because he's always talking about it. See, when it departs out of our mouths, we shut up about it. We don't read it anymore. We don't talk about God's word. It's not part of our lives. It's not something that naturally flows out of us because we're not filled up with it. So it's not flowing out. That way, it has departed out of our mouths because when you're not talking about God's word, when you're not talking about the Lord and the great things he has done in your life and in, this, in the Bible, right, and that he's going to do, then it's departed out of your mouth because you're not speaking about it anymore. Don't let that happen to you, okay? He and the Israelites were to meditate on God's law just as we today are to meditate on God's word. We have the writings that they had back then, translations of them, and we have the new covenant under Jesus Christ, and we have those writings also. We have what the apostles wrote down for us. Or we have enough of what was written and what has been preserved for us to know God, to know his character, to know his ways, to know what he expects and demands of us, to know how to be saved, to know how to live a righteous life. And you know what? The same thing is expected of us today. We are also to meditate on God's word, just like Joshua was commanded to. That command carries forward to every single one of God's children, okay? Okay. So it means that we read it. We have to read his word to know what it is, 
right? What is God's word? We got to read it. So you've got to obtain a copy of it so you can read it for yourself. We study it. You go over something. You dig into something. You, you can do word studies. You can do subject studies. You, you know, study books, chapters. And the big thing is to read it. All of it. And when you read all of it, read it again. Keep doing that even as you study. And you do these word studies or you do theme studies or you do subject studies. You keep reading God's word even while you're studying different things. You always feed your spirit on God's word. Okay? You ponder it. You know, you may read something. There's plenty of things in here that you can read and get stumped on because we're in these flesh bodies, because we didn't live back then and different things, and because some of it is just a little bit complicated to get a hold of it. And you can be like, what? What does that mean? So you're pondering it. You're remembering what you read, and you're thinking about it, and you're trying to get sense out of it. You're pondering it. You think about it. And when we have questions, when you read those passages or those things that you don't get or you don't get at all or it doesn't make good sense to you and we're thinking on those things, then you take those to prayer. You take those questions to God in prayer. Take them to prayer to God and research and dig deeper into those things that stump or puzzle you. And you can also, you can ask me. Um, I can definitely, if I don't know, I'll let you know I don't know. And we can definitely take it to God in prayer and see what he has to say about it. Um, I can tell you that there is no one on this earth who knows it all. There's no minister, no pastor, no evangelist, no teacher. No one on this earth knows it all. But I can tell you one thing. Every time I loop back through this Bible... All the time staying in the Word of God, I learn more and more and see more clearly and hear His voice more clearly. That's what happens when you feed on God's Word. You get stronger in the Lord, okay? So meditating on God's Word, you mull it over in your mind. And that is what it means to meditate on God's Word. You read it, you study it, you think about it, you ponder it, you mull it over in your mind, you pray about it to the Lord, you stand on His Word. All of these things, that's how you meditate on God's Word. Like Scott was trying to be funny this morning, and he said, oh, do we go out somewhere and, you know, uh, in a field and sit with our you know, hands or fingers or whatever, and it's like, no. You see, all of that... All of that has nothing to do with biblical meditation at all, at all. In fact, that's one of the easiest ways to spot somebody who is not meditating in God's word and in his way. You don't sit like that. You don't do your fingers and all the stuff like that. You don't chant. None of that. None of that is biblical meditation, but it is meditating, studying, focusing, thinking about, pondering, praying, and asking God to clear up those passages you don't understand, researching, digging deeper into them, and always be led by the Holy Spirit because there are wrong teachings. There are wrong theologians, plenty of them. They would be called false teachers out online presenting wrong information. You've got to be led by the Holy Spirit to vet out that information. And be led by God to know what's right and what's not. So, you read his word every day. And when you have read the whole Bible, you go through it again. I cannot say that enough. I have never stopped reading God's word since I really and truly got saved. I am just in his word. I can't get enough of it. I, I'm always, you know, learning and growing. And he ministers and speaks to me every time I'm in his word. God will meet you there. He will speak to you. And always pray over your reading before you read God's word because you want him to open it up to you. You want to ask the Lord to open the scriptures to you just like Jesus did to those disciples when he walked with them on the Emmaus Road and he had already resurrected and he was cloaking himself from them so they didn't know who he was. And it said he opened the scriptures about himself to them Pray that and watch God go to work because he, he will answer those kind of prayers. That's the kind of prayer for sure God's going to answer. He answers all prayers from his children. 
might not always be the way we want it, right? But the ones that are for sure lined up and in his will, he's going to answer, okay? He's going to answer the way you expect him to answer. That's what I mean, because he answers all of our prayers, but maybe not the way we want, okay? It's okay. You never stop reading his word as long as you live. You keep reading it, and the Holy Spirit will keep teaching you, and you will grow up and mature in Christ that way. You will learn to discern because you'll have more of his word in you, okay? Reading God's word helps your, you to feed your spirit man, and in so doing, then you will be more discerning and you will be able to test the spirits when someone comes around you telling you this or that. You'll be able to know what spirit are they speaking by or what spirit did they interact with. There are many people today that want to impress others uh, because Satan and the demons, they will come and give you miraculous or supernatural those mystical experiences and then they'll make that person feel singled out special supernatural maybe super smart super special gifted and then that person will go and tell others and what they are big on doing is i had a vision i had a dream and when you listen to it and, and a lot of these let's just here's an example Someone saying, oh, an angel came and, you know, interacted with me or I saw an angel in my home or this or that. I know a lady one time saying she saw an angel out of the corner of her eye. She wasn't scared. She didn't, wasn't in fear. She didn't tremble. She didn't, none of the stuff that we read about in the Bible. When an angel was on the scene, usually, many times, the person was scared that they were going to be killed because they had just seen God. They were trembling. They would fall down in reverence. And the holy angels would say, don't, uh, you know, don't worship me, worship God. God was the one who sent them and who was speaking through them. These are the encounters we see in Scripture with angels. There's fear. There's reverence. There's the holiness there. There's not just this whole, oh, they told me what kind of sauce to use in my spaghetti. And then they went on their way. <laughs> We're going to believe this kind of nonsense? You know, we have got to stop believing. First of all, it comes back to the people. You know, we can't take everybody at face value who says they're a Christian. I learned that lesson the hard way. You know, being so naive, you know, a, a young baby Christian, thinking everybody who said that really was. Uh, no, I have come uh, far surpassed that point in my life. So that's we first have to be discerning about their lives. What kind of life are they living? Do they have godly fruit? Do they speak about the Lord? Do they speak about his word? You know, what kind of life are they just showing up for a social club, for entertainment church? Are they commercial Christians? You know, are they crisis Christians? They only cry out to God when, you know, the going gets tough and they need help and otherwise they have nothing to do with him. You know, or something, you know, bad enough gets cranked up on them and they're a crisis Christian just in that moment. Are they a Christian? We have to look at those things and be discerning. You're not going to be able to be discerning if you don't feed yourself on God's word. And uh, that's what he means by meditating on it. Staying in it. Okay, keeping it on your mind, on your heart, and in your life. Now let's go to Psalm 1, 1 through 3, talking about meditating on God's word, biblical meditation. Blessed is the man that walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, or that is, who does not walk in step with the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, or nor stand in the way that sinners take, nor sits in the seat of the scornful, or nor sits in the company with mockers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law does he meditate day and night. He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth its fruit in its season, whose leaf also shall not wither, and whatever he does shall prosper. Now you see that? Don't do all these sinful things. Don't keep company with them. Don't be like them. Don't do what they do. Don't go where they go. Don't be part of that crowd. But it's saying, come over here and delight yourself in the law of the Lord, in his word, right? In Jesus Christ. And then, you know what it said? If you live like that, you're not going to, your leaf's not going to wither. And whatever you do, 
you're going to prosper. That's what we want. So we want to meditate on God's word. We want to be all about him. We want to hunger and thirst after righteousness because we will be filled. Okay? So we now see two times now, twice in scripture, God has told us that he will give us good success and make our way prosperous if we stay in his word and apply it to our lives. And I will say prosperous does not just mean monetarily either. So don't get hung up thinking if you just keep reading God's word that he's going to make you rich, right? That, that's already a wrong attitude, a wrong mindset. It's not a Christian one, right? So don't get hung up on that. Don't just associate the word prosper with money because it's more than that, okay? That's not what's being said there. Many, many times the Bible doesn't even mean money when it says prosper, okay? And if you read his word, you will remember what Jesus said about the rich man. It's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. So let's not be fixated on trying to get rich. You know, God will break that down and break that kind of stuff off of you. He wants to take care of you. He wants to bless your life and meet your needs. But he's not trying to make you filthy rich like what Satan has pushed his puppets out to make people want to covet and be greedy and jealous and try to be and live like them. They're not the mark. Jesus Christ is that we're trying to attain to, okay? So to meditate in God's word day and night means it's a lifestyle. It should be a lifestyle for you if you love Jesus, if you're his. You stay in his word every day and his word is always on your heart and mind. You practice it continually in your life. When things happen in your life, you relate it back to God's word. You stand on his word. You pray his word. And in, uh, you pray his word in prayer. You teach it to your children. It's everything to you. It's your life. You look at the things that go on in this world with a Christian view. Then you look at it with biblical lenses. You look at it as applied to God's word. It's part of your daily life. That's how you meditate on God's word. Okay? And I'll, before I go into this next passage, I'll just share one more thing that uh, was on my mind. There is a passage of Scripture whenever Abraham's servant went out to get a wife for Isaac, and he was coming back with her. They had finally traveled back. They were on camels, and they were there at the point of now she's about to meet Isaac. And Isaac, the Bible says he had gone out in, in a field or in the field to meditate. Now, that's all King James says today. And you could read that and be like, uh, so you could get that image, what the world, what Satan has pushed out to us, where somebody's out there sitting Indian style with their legs crossed doing their, doing their little stuff, right? Chanting or humming or whatever. That's what, you, that's what comes to our minds first because that's what we've been so conditioned by Satan in the world system to think meditation means. Well, you know, the 1611, King James 1611 Bible plainly says he went out in the field to pray. Wur, wur, that's quite a big difference. Do you see? We're talking about biblical meditation. And so they were, uh, that was prayer initially was there, not meditate. Now today we read meditate and we have a whole different thought process that goes into that, right? So think about him out there praying and thinking on God's word and spending time with the Lord. And think about that biblical, godly kind of meditation, okay? Now let's look at Romans 12, 2. And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove or discern what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God? We renew our minds by having God's spirit inside of us. We have to be saved first, right? We've got to have his spirit inside of us because the word of God is only understood by the Holy Spirit anyway. 
So an unbeliever can't understand God's word. It's for believers. We have to have God's spirit inside of us and reading his word, reading it, not just read it once and say, I did that, check, check it off of your bucket list. It's not a bucket list for Christians, right? It's a way of life. We stay in God's word. We grow up and mature in God's word. We get closer to him the more we stay in his word, stronger in him, okay? So um, that's how we renew our minds. We take a worldly mind. We, I, we take me, for example, and how, or even Scott, how he used to walk around saying, well, I'm a good person. He was trying to justify himself without Jesus. You cannot do that. No one could be righteous and renewed back into a right standing with God without Jesus shedding his holy and precious blood and being our sacrifice. None of us could have gotten it done. Nobody down through time got it done. Even the early apostles said in God's word, they couldn't keep his word. If they couldn't keep it, we are, we're not better than them. We can't keep it either. And so we needed Jesus. We needed a savior. We needed to be redeemed from out from under the yoke, the bondage that Satan had around our neck and our lives. And the, and the way forward was Jesus Christ. He is the way, the truth, and the life. So that's how we renew those worldly minds from that wrong thinking. I'm a good person. That's wrong thinking that's going to send you to hell, right? Yeah, maybe, you know, and, and it's so sad. We equate being good enough for heaven with just not having killed someone. Well, you know what? I killed two people because I aborted two babies. So I murdered two people. So I wasn't getting it done in my own strength, that's for sure. That was wrong thinking a wrong mind i hadn't fed on god's word i wasn't laid on that right foundation when i was younger i wasn't taught deep and thorough on these things so when we renew that kind of a mind by getting in god's word and and hearing what he has to say you don't shed innocent blood right let his word minister to you and grow you up that's how we renew our minds. We stay in, in his word and read it continually. We are to study God's word. Stay in God's word always and pray before you read his word, asking him to teach you by his spirit to open your spiritual eyes, ears, and understanding, your spiritual understanding. Ask the Lord for more godly knowledge and wisdom that comes through reading his word and for more of his spirit. Ask him for more of his Holy Spirit. You want more of his spirit in you. There is more of his spirit. There is more anointing. Pray for it. Seek it. Ask for it. Ask him for more revelation. He will reveal. He wants you to know and understand his word. Pray and ask him for more revelation. And thank him for the revelation that he has given you. And for how far he has brought you in your Christian life. Ask him to help you to understand the parts that you don't get and help you to relate his word to your life. You want to know how his word applies to your life today and for his help in living out his word in your life. And I want to tell you something. On those scripture passages, the difficult ones or the things that seem like they stump you, don't get hung up on that. Pray and lift it up to the Lord and move on. Don't worry about it. He will reveal what he wants you to know in his timing. He grows each one of us up in different ways. We learn different lessons, different tests, different trials at different times. Okay, so don't get hung up on it. Pray about it. Lift it up to God. See what you can dig out and find out about it and then move on. Okay? If you do a word study and look up every occurrence of the word, this is what I'm, I'm saying here. If you wanted to do a word study on the word meditate, if you looked up in the Bible every occurrence of the word meditate, you will see that it always pertained to God's word or it pertained to God himself or it pertained to his marvelous works. So it was like thinking about and pondering and God's word or it was thinking about and pondering God himself who he is, his character, what he's done, and his marvelous works. Staying and, and thinking about the marvelous things, the miracles, the wonders, the creation, 
that he just spoke into existence. All of those things was what, what is connected to the word meditate every time. It's not empty your mind, get over here, get in your position, get your stance going, get your fingers, get your chant. Get, it's none of that. None of that. It was always God's word, God himself, and God's marvelous works. And that's what they meditated on with their minds, with their heart. And that was what they were to think about, what they were to study on, what they were to pray about, what they were to ponder and keep in their hearts and minds and uh, live out in their lives the very things that God spoke and said to do. And that is godly meditation. That is as plain and clear as I can lay it out for you guys. That's godly meditation. Now, we have seen what God has to say about what kind of meditation pertains to Christians. That's the only kind of meditation that pertains to us. That's it. None of that other stuff that I've been exposing. This is godly meditation, okay? Now, let's take another look at New Age meditation. I'm still not done with it. <laughs> As I have already stated, and I'm not going to try to explain all the different types of meditation, there are way too many, too many. The main thing you need to know as a Christian is that none of those other types of meditation are godly. None of them. So for you, those are all off limits. Meditation practices can be found in Buddhism, Hinduism, Christianity, Judaism, and Islam, and I will just say there should not be any, this is research, there shouldn't be any meditation associated with Christianity except what I've just discussed straight from God's word. Meditate on him, his word alone. And some people practice meditation independent of any religion, but are likewise looking for a sense of peace and insightfulness offered through the religious practices. It all seems to run back to some type of religion. And all of those other meditations are ungodly. They're occult meditation. We live in a stressed out world and many people are searching for peace and relief from all the stress. And a lot of it is busy lives. Too busy. It's like you need to order your life. You need to cut out some of your activities and some of the things that are stressing you out and wasting your time and burning you down. That's where a lot of stress is coming from. Um, but the world is all stressed out, and so much so that meditation is being advised by doctors to their patients as a way to relieve stress. It's being taught or included in many school systems. And remember the Indian doctor that I was sharing about that I had taken Kennedy to, um, that he was advising her to meditate? This was after she had COVID and she was having some breathing problems and so we had to go down this line of doctors and we, we met up with this Indian doctor. It's okay to be an Indian, Pastor Dauber is, <laughs> but he's Christian. He serves the Lord Jesus Christ, him and his family. So that's not the point of this. The point is uh, he was an Indian Hindu who was not saved. So he was pushing his religious system out through his practice as a doctor. So he was trying to get Kennedy to meditate, and it was like, that ain't going to happen. As Barney Fife would say, I was nipping that in the bud. So um, I told the man that we believe in Jesus and that I knew, you know, that must have been funny for him to hear because I'm here with my child who's having problems with her breathing. So that must have been funny for him to hear. He must have thought, ha ha, whatever with Jesus, you're here seeing me, and he's a Hindu. So I told him that um, I knew that Jesus would heal her. And in the meantime, we were trying to do what we could do to get help and relief for Kennedy. He asked me what my occupation was, and I told him a pastor. Immediately after I said I was a pastor, he said, Oh, Lord, just like that. And I said, Oh, Lord is right. I said, He's the one you need. <laughs> Now, that doctor might not have been sick physically, but his soul was sick because he was not a saved man. 
And he, he's already, he's deceived already in serving the gods, the fallen angels that he's serving. He's rejecting Jesus and it stands right now. Right now, he is on the path to the lake of fire. He clearly didn't want to hear anything about Jesus. He was practically running out of the room at that point. <laughs> it don't take long if you get serious to some of these people and you speak up about Jesus. Uh, he, he is a showstopper, I'll put it that way. <laughs> so now, let's take a look at transcendental meditation in schools. I found this piece of information when I was researching Johnny Depp. This man, David Lynch, remember Johnny Depp with his meditation, and so I ran into this information I wanted to share. So this man, David Lynch, worked with Johnny on a film in 2017. Now, this is what an article from the New York Times shared about this guy. The director, David Lynch, is starting the David Lynch Foundation for Consciousness-Based Education and World Peace, which will fund transcendental meditation classes and research into the effects of yoga on body and mind. The blue velvet filmmaker says he is convinced he can alleviate the world's suffering by teaching society about the Hindu chanting technique and its founder, Maharishi Mahesh Yogi. Lynch, 59, hopes to raise $7 billion within a year, which will go toward forming peace-creating supergroups of 8,000 meditators. These are groups of 8,000 meditators around the world. They say around the globe. Students today are even more stressed out, he says, but when they meditate, they will start shining like a bright, shiny penny and their anxieties will go away. By diving within, they will attain a field of pure consciousness, pure bliss, creativity, intelligence, dynamic peace. Look at what these rich people are spending their money on. They spend it on Satan's kingdom because that's what he requires. If he's going to bless you with these riches, you're going to spend it on his kingdom for his glory, right? It's part of their worship to him. In order to have the benefits that he blesses them with, they will serve his agenda. Here, top U.S. meditation teacher brings his message to stressed-out Britons. Guru Bob Roth, who numbers Katy Perry and Hugh Jackman among his fans, is set is to set up a TM, which is Transcendental Meditation, right? They call it TM for short. So he's to set up a TM project in London schools. From left to right is teacher and author Bob Roth, then you have singer Katy Perry, and then film director David Lynch, who set up a charity to promote TM. The photograph is by David X. Prudding and Rex. Now, we just read about David Lynch's plans to spread TM all over the globe in a major way, billions of dollars spending on that to push that agenda out. And one way he's doing that is he's partnered with this Bob Roth guy who they're calling a guru. And that's what he is, teaching this stuff. Um, he goes all around the world teaching TM. And what? Let's, we're fixing to watch this video. I want you to watch it and hear it straight from his own mouth what he's doing. Listen to this. Afterwards, one of the first thoughts that I had because I felt really good afterwards, was not, oh, I want to get enlightened. It was, oh, I want to teach this to inner city school kids. So that was Jan June 28th, 1969. And I became a teacher in 1972, and I started teaching it in the San Francisco Bay Area, and I taught it at San Quentin Prison to inmates and guards, and I taught it at um, Apple Computer later on, and I taught it at General Motors in Fremont, and I taught it at schools in the Mission District, if you know San Francisco, and Hunters Point. And then almost 13 years ago, I got together with David Lynch, who is a very dear friend, and there could be no one more opposite than me than David Lynch, just because of just, just and yet we're like brothers. 
And I said to David, I really want to start a foundation that's going to bring this meditation, because he was a meditator, bring this to kids. And he said, great. And then I said, I'd really like to call it the David Lynch Foundation. I don't think he was paying that close of attention. He said, great. And I said, can I write a press release? This is announcing it. And he said, great. I probably was editing, you know, Inland Empire or something. And um, I wrote a press release and I sent it out with this intention. We both had an intention to do something good. I sent out the press release. It got picked up by Agence France Press, Reuters and Associated Press. And two days later, because of David, it was in the, almost the front pages of 1,500 newspapers. And David called me up and he said, what's a 501c3? <laughs> and I said, I'm not sure. We learned about it. We just had a desire to offer something good. And now the foundation is almost 13 years old. We provided scholarships for 600,000 inner city school kids to learn to meditate in all over the United States, in the Middle East, in Africa, Congo, Uganda, all over Latin America, everywhere, in Buddhist schools, in Muslim schools, in Catholics, because it's not a religion. And so now we sit here today where meditation, see I did bring it around to meditation, where meditation is more mainstream. How many people here have tried some form of meditation? Okay, and real quick, you know how he said he did this press release and it zoomed and it went out in like 1,500 papers like instantly because of David Lynch, because it was David Lynch. No, it's because it's Satan's agenda. He promotes what he wants to promote on his platform, on his world stage. And you see, this man is on board going around this whole world, teaching it everywhere. Large mega corporations, he was at Apple teaching it, he's in the prisons teaching it, he's in the schools teaching it, because Satan wants this to get out. Because as we have already learned, it is connecting people directly into and with the demonic to be active in their lives and in their bodies. So, of course, Satan wants to get this out everywhere. Now, um, this agenda to get children meditating is growing. It's growing. Like I said, if it's not in your school system where you live, where your children attend, you better thank the Lord Jesus Christ because they are pushing and hammering and pushing and trying to get this through. They're just going to keep at it. They're just keeping on with it until they can get it introduced in some way. Okay? And um, so, notice he casually stated that they are teaching it in all sorts of different religious schools. And he said, because it's not a religion. He is presenting it as if there's no conflict with any religion. And people who are accepting this they don't have godly discernment. People who are accepting it do not have godly discernment. But he mentioned Buddhists, he mentioned Hindus, and he mentioned Catholics. Those are all religions, right? The Buddhists meditate, the Hindus meditate. And those Catholics, that's the face of Mystery Babylon. <laughs> They're practicing, you know, a cleaned up version of witchcraft right out in the open. So I don't know you know, if they've got meditation going on or not, but they've got all other kind of wickedness, praying to and through dead saints and praying to Mary and doing everything ungodly. But um, well, it is a religion. We've already learned that one. Hands down, we already know that it is. Um, and when you look at it deeper as we have, when they, when they attend that puja ceremony, initiation is what it's called, and they're chanting Hindu gods' names. It certainly is rooted in Hinduism, where they worship millions of gods, and it is a religion. Remember, we have already learned and uncovered so many different times. They will say whatever you want to hear to get you to do it. They don't have a problem with deception and lying. You know, and just like we listened to Mario's testimony last week, he said whenever he was going to teach yoga, which has the meditation, has the poses, has the breathing, breathing exercise, has all of it. He said he had to learn the Hindu scriptures because that's what he's teaching is Hinduism. Okay? So continuing the research, 
one of the organizations reaping the benefits of positive peer pressure is the David Lynch Foundation, which focuses on teaching transcendental meditation to students in inner city schools. A quote said, I'm completely in favor of the David Lynch Foundation's quiet time program. Now see if parents just hear that they have quiet time in school, they're not going to question that. They're going to think it's just when they're making the kids be quiet and do their studies or read or study or do whatever. They're going to be like, okay, quiet time, that's fine. See how they've got this little tag name for it so you don't realize what it really is? The research on it is showing that when kids are meditating twice a day in school, there are improvements in all kinds of important areas because teens are so rewarding to each other. What I am focusing on, this is probably the David Lynch Foundation and David Lynch himself. So he says, what I'm focusing on now in my own work is trying to get kids in schools to meditate together. Developing meditation clubs, even meditation buddies, and having schools develop study halls where kids can meditate because teenagers typically don't want to do stuff that other kids are not doing. They know it's easier if their friend is going to do it than they're going to do it too. They know that. They're working every angle, every angle. That is the brilliance of these David Lynch school programs. Everybody's doing it. Be careful about what everybody's doing because the Lord tells us in his word, the way is narrow and there are few that find and enter in at the narrow, on the narrow path at the straight gate, which is the narrow gate. These people are on the wide path. Everybody's doing it. When everybody's doing it, that's the wide path. Okay. So they're sparing no expense to promote TM and get it spread all over the world. Let's run through some pictures to give you a better idea. The phrase, everybody's doing it, is just like Aleister Crowley's statement, do what thou wilt shall be the whole of the law. And remember, he was the big guru Satanist calling himself the beast and uh, calling himself 666 and all of these things after his master. That is walking down that wide path that leads to destruction. Let's go through these pictures, you guys. This first one. David Lynch Foundation presents Change Begins Within. A gala dinner and conversation. Now that gala, that goes back to those gala priests that I talked about. Uh, I wanted to say it might have been in the, the Amen teaching series or it could have been on... Uh, Christian women but that gala what's really mixed up in that is when those priests were men dressing as women they were castrated and they were sodomites and there and there was perversion mixed up in that and so we see that those priests we see that gala priest being promoted today on Satan's platform in these gala dinners because many of Hollywood are presenting one way when they are really something else. It might be wearing a dress when it's really a man. The bones and the structure of it, really a man, but presents as a woman. So that's what's wrapped up in these gala dinners that they're having here. So it goes on. Uh, and the, so the change that they're talking about is through transcendental meditation, change within so you're going to be changed when you get into that stuff, that's for sure. So this was held in 2015. And I tell you, they're promoting this TM, Transcendental Meditation, big time. Look at this one. The caption on this picture read, Mesmerizing Performance at the Change Begins Within Gala by Katy Perry. And I'm telling you, so, you know, they had to throw down big money to pay her to come there. They're sparing no expense in promoting this to the world often referred to as the quiet time program, the students and teachers meditate for 10 to 20 minutes twice per day. The program consists of TM instruction and follow-up, as well as training of school faculty and staff to supervise the TM sessions offered at the school. Now here's one. Quiet time 
changes lives. Since I started TM, life has gotten a lot easier. I think more clearly and I don't rush into things. Plus, my grades have gone up. That was from Cecilia, who is a seventh grader. Consciousness-based education. TM in schools. Integral Yoga Magazine published that. Consciousness-based education. And she's on here saying she had a great wonderful experience with it even her grades have gone up studying the bible and praying to god in jesus's name was kicked out of public schools however hinduism through transcendental meditation is being promoted on a grand scale and of course satan will have something positive published to promote the idea that it's really going to benefit you in a good way don't forget the lives of those who meditated and ended in destruction. Their lives went down in ruin and misery and damnation. Remember Elvis Presley. He is a major witness to us about it. He meditated. He would meditate before he would go out and sing his concert performances and read even from the books of Levatsky while he was out on stage. Simone was not truly at peace and happy in her life either when she was involved in all of this. Don't forget Wally's testimony about where it ultimately leads when he came face to face with the demon that manifested and he knew his life was on the line. And remember what we've learned in the past weeks, uh, just like what Mario shared about all of the back burning and the pain and he was throwing up every day and he was just sick all the time, headaches, and even um, what uh, Pervy had shared. Like he had shared she was losing her hair, she was having all kinds of skin problems, and just her, you know, she was just breaking down with sickness. And they try to look past that. And see, Satan ain't going to publish that. Come over here and do this where you'll get deathly sick and all kind of bad things. Well, he's not, never going to tell you that. So, all right, let's continue. Here's this one, the New York Times. Under stress, students in New York schools find calm in meditation. There they are teaching these young minds to meditate, and it's not biblical at all. Look at this one. 450-plus schools in Mexico meditate for peace. Jesus is the Prince of Peace, and they are not seeking Jesus here. Ain't going to be no peace without Jesus. But this is a part of their deception, rolling it out, that they can do this to bring in peace. Now, here's another one. Parents Against Transcendental Meditation tries to end the stealth ritual initiation of students into the TM program. Now, here they are. Look at them up on their desk with their young minds being deceived and initiated into this demonic practice and religion. And notice that one said parents against transcendental meditation. Now, here's David Lynch, the one who they're using in a big way to promote this. Consciousness-based education, which I am helping to promote, is basically the same education that good schools are giving today with transcendental meditation added for the students, teachers, staff, and principal. David Lynch. So it's just an addition to make it even better is what he's saying. And look here again. Look at these young children. This is Laura Sapulu um, RD, TM for kids. And they've got them all doing those poses, doing the hand uh, movements and trying to clear their minds and empty their minds. Here's another one, Newsweek. The movement of meditation replacing detention in schools. So now it can be used as, oh, you act up? I'm going to send you to meditation. <laughs> I'm going to go ahead. What's really happening is I'm going to send you over here so you can go ahead and get more demons. You already acted up and got in trouble. Now I'm going to get the demons act activated in your life. <laughs> now here's another one. Paley Center, National Education Summit on Quiet Time in the Classroom. Oh, it's just quiet time. The Center for Leadership Performance, they have adopted this name, Quiet Time, so they can slide this past most unsuspecting parents. 
and look at this picture. Religion News Service, lawsuit against Chicago Public Schools TM program can go forward. Now, this was recent. This was in 2021 that a lawsuit was being brought against all of this in some of the Chicago schools. If you have children in the public school and they are having quiet time, which is transcendental meditation, if they're teaching them meditation in any form, yoga, you as an informed parent, you need to stand up for your religious freedom and rights and say, no, not for my child, you don't. You make sure they keep your child out of it and you make sure you tell your child you don't participate in any of this. If that teacher tries to get you to do this and then you say, no, you're not to have any part of it. Stand up. Protect and defend your children. And like I always say, it's one of the first things God called me to do was to homeschool Kennedy. And I praise God that she is not even, you know, having to deal with any of this nonsense because she's homeschooled. And she's having a Christian, Christian curriculum. She studies the Bible every day in her school. And um, if you can homeschool your child, don't not do it just because you want the spare time, you want the free time. If you're in a position to do it, you should be doing it. If you're, uh, you know, a household where both parents work, that's understandable. But if you're in a position where you're able to do it, then you should be homeschooling your child. Okay. The following research that I'm about to share is from two researchers who researched the effects of meditation. Let's hear this research on the effects of it. There were some negative effects discovered about meditation, but they chose to call them challenges instead of negative experiences. You know, always got to sugarcoat and um, soften things down instead of presenting it, right? Straight out for the truth, so it's, they're calling them challenges. But so listen to this. We've all heard about the benefits of meditation ad nauseum. Those disciplined enough to practice regularly are rewarded with increased control over the brain waves, known as alpha rhythms, which leads to better focus and may help ease pain. In addition to calming the mind and body, meditation can also reduce the markers of stress in people with anxiety disorders. Rigorous studies have backed health claims such as these to convince therapists, physicians, and corporate gurus to embrace meditation's potential so that they will say it to their, you know, students or to their patients or whatever, so they'll embrace it. And they'll, they'll go, well, the research says, you know, these wonderful things happen, so okay, yeah, go home and do this. What contemporary and ancient meditators have always known, however, is that while the hype may be warranted, the practice is not all peace, love, and blissful glimpses of unreality. Sitting zazen, gazing at their third eye, a person can encounter extremely unpleasant emotions and physical or mental disturbances. Physical or mental. Listen to this. Zen Buddhism has a word for the warped perceptions that can arise during meditation called makiyo. I may be saying it wrong. Makiyo which combines the Japanese words for devil and objective world. I don't want to have no part of something that's got a word with the devil mixed into it, and I'm just going to forge ahead with it. Listen to this. Philip Kaplow, the late American Zen master, once described confronting Macchio as a dredging and cleansing process that releases stressful experiences in deep layers of the mind. The researchers identified 59 kinds of unexpected or unwanted experiences which they classified into seven domains. Cognitive, perceptual, affective, which is related to moods, somatic, cognitive, related to motivation, sense of self, and social. Among the experiences described to them were feelings of anxiety and fear, involuntary twitching, insomnia, a sense of complete detachment from one's emotions, hypersensitivity to light or sound, 
distortion in time and space, nauseousness, hallucinations, irritability, and the re-experiencing of past traumas. The associated levels of distress and impairment range from mild and transient to severe and lasting, according to the study. Most would not imagine that these side effects could be hiding behind the lotus print curtains of your local meditation center. And I'm going to tell you one more time, this is bad fruit, you guys. Bad fruit. And, and one stands out really where it says that the person is having a, a sense of complete detachment from their emotions. Do you know that the demons do not love? They are not peaceful. They are not joyful. They are not about those things because they are separated, fallen. They are away from God. They departed from him. They don't have those things. And when you see somebody being like that, it's because they are associating, they are at, they are. Um, interacting with demons and they are more like the demons the master who they're serving than they are like Jesus when they're cold hearted right cold blooded and all that cold hearted that's coming down the line of Satan the serpent okay so that's what you can see right there when you get somebody like that that's emotionless and don't have any motion emotion going on and it's from meditation you know we know trauma causes different things but from meditation, you're interacting with the wrong gods. Those are demons, fallen angels. There's only one God. His name is Jesus Christ of Nazareth. In closing, and I will tell you all, this is a warning to all of you parents out there that are listening, to all of you who are guardians of children who are oversee the care of young children. It's to all of you guys. You are responsible for the children that God has blessed you with, that he has placed in your care. You're responsible. You are to be rooted and grounded on the firm foundation of Jesus Christ and God's word. Jesus is our God. He's our God. Under him, you parents and guardians, you are another layer of protection for your children. Everything is to be under Jesus Christ. He's the head. He's the head of the church. He's the head of the body. And you are to be under him. He is the first layer, okay? And then you are a layer of protection over them under Jesus, okay? You're a spiritual covering over your children's lives. Talk with them and find out what is being taught in their schools. Be vigilant. Stay in the know. Keep up with them. Who are their friends? What teachers, you know, who are their teachers? Who's their favorite teacher? What are they learning? You need to take an active interest and role in your child's education, even if they are in public school. Stay on top of it. And if there's yoga or meditation of any sort, you need to stand up against it. You better get down to that school. You better let them know it ain't for my child. Arm yourselves with the facts. You can come with the facts before you get there so they can understand what you're saying because otherwise they're just going to be like, it's just a peaceful, meditative, quiet time. What are you talking about? Right? So you better arm yourself with the facts, take it back to this puja initiation ceremony that someone there, faculty, staff, teachers, even if they didn't have the kids bring an offering, didn't bring flowers, didn't bring a white handkerchief, they did these things in some way, shape, or form, okay? So I would let them know that you know it is all about Hinduism and your child has not to have any part of it. We're to protect our children, okay? Um, because this will bring demonic activity into their lives. It will. Even, even though you're, you could be saying, well, you know, they're innocent, and surely God will protect them. Have you read in the Bible where the man came to Jesus to get his son delivered, and Jesus asked, how long has this been going on? And he said, since an infant. Satan is no respecter of persons. He doesn't care what sex you are. He doesn't care what age you are. He doesn't care who you 
what family you're born in. He doesn't care. He wants you. He wants your child. He wants people. And he wants to tear us down, destroy our lives, kill, steal, and destroy. Okay? So, don't deceive yourselves with that lie. Okay? Um, and I have seen so... Uh, I have seen where there are so many out there standing against transcendental meditation. That's why I've been bringing up some of these lawsuits that are mentioned, where they are rising up and standing against it when they have enough godly discernment to recognize it. Uh, even atheists stand against it because they don't want nothing to do with God, you know. So they're down there. They're down there at the school saying, my child ain't participating in this. See? The atheists, they ain't just against the Bible and Jesus. They're against all religion. So they're, they're down there fighting it out to keep their poor little kids away from, from Jesus and away from, you know, that's a good thing, away from the Hinduism. But the sad thing is they'll fight just as hard against the Bible and against prayer. So there's that. But be active in your child's life. Teach them God's word. Teach them to love and obey Jesus Christ. Stand for Jesus and against these satanic practices. Protect your children while they're in your care. And always cover them in prayer and with the blood of Jesus Christ. And even if they've grown up and they've already moved out of the house and moved away from home, you know, uh, moved on with their lives, they have their own home or they've gotten married or whatever, you always, as a parent, as a guardian who they were once in your care, those children... You love them, you pray over them, you keep them covered in the blood of Jesus Christ. You keep on praying for them. As a parent, we're never going to stop praying for our children, right? You keep on praying for them, even if they're out of the house, and you keep on praying, all right? So, excuse me, do your part as that extra layer of protection, that secondary spiritual covering over them to protect and guard over them while they're in your care. All right? That's what God expects us to do. Teach them and train them up in his word and show them what is godly and what is not. It's okay. We are going to be back on some more of this meditation next week. I have just a little bit more that I want to cover. And once I get it covered, we're going to take a break because we've been on New Age for a while. We're going to take a break and we're going to do, I'm going to do some um, biblical, what I call straight biblical teachings. We need that. We need to feed our spirit man. And uh, we're going to do some of those. And then I'm, I am, I am going to come back to the New Age teachings because there's still so much. There's so much more to this New Age stuff, teachings, occult, religion, and it's right in the churches. It's right in the churches. So a couple of more probably on meditation. Then we're going to move away from it and do some biblical teachings. And then I'm going to come back to it, okay? We just kind of need a break, a refresher for our spirit, all right? So let's go to prayer, you guys. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you, Heavenly Father. Thank you for Jesus Christ. You provided our sacrifice in Jesus Christ. And I thank you, dear Lord Jesus, that you humbled yourself even to the point of being crucified to do the Father's will. And you went to that cross and you were crucified for us. You endured the shame of the cross for the joy that was set before you. I thank you, dear Lord Jesus, for shedding your holy and precious blood for each and every one of us, because the Bible says without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins. Thank you, Lord Jesus, that you did that for us, that we're not having to take the lives of innocent little animals today. We're not having to kill goats and, and you know, sheep and cows and birds and all the things. I thank you, Lord Jesus, for being our sacrifice, the one and only, the final sacrifice Lord Jesus, you are King of kings and Lord of lords. You are high and lifted up, Lord Jesus. You are a king of the whole universe. I magnify you, Lord Jesus. And dear Heavenly Father, you and you alone are God. There is none like you. Nothing compares to you, Heavenly Father. 
You are holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for the good plans that you have for each one of our lives. Plans for a future and a hope, not to harm us, but to prosper us. And I praise you, dear Heavenly Father, and I thank you, Lord, for revealing these things to us so that we can warn our family members and our friends and, and keep them, keep our children out of these things and protect them from these things, teach them the truth. Thank you for making us aware of these things, Heavenly Father. And dear Lord Jesus, I lift my hands toward the congregation as a servant on your altar, Lord Jesus. I'm calling on you. The word of God says that by Jesus' stripes we were healed. I know that for everyone who comes to you and believes in you and is seeking you and has asked forgiveness and is living a righteous life through the power of the Holy Spirit, that we have been healed spiritually because we've come out from under the yoke of bondage Satan had on our lives. But I know this also means a physical healing in our bodies now in this life. And I know that you still heal today. There are too many testimonies and you have healed in my life and my family's as well. And I'm looking to you, Lord Jesus, and I'm lifting up everyone out there who needs a healing, who has faith to be healed and they're seeking to be healed. I lift up the prayer request all the way back to the beginning of the ministry for those that are needing a healing, seeking a healing. Lord Jesus, if their healing hasn't come and hasn't manifest yet, I'm lifting them up to you, Lord Jesus. And I want to lift up Marla to you. She works with horses, and she's had a lot of injuries over the years. Um, and she has shared that it hurts to walk. It hurts her to sit. She has had... Um, so many different injuries working with these horses and she said like the only place that it doesn't really hurt is if she lays down she is one to lead a horse at a walk and a trot in a horse show this summer and lord jesus she is in a lot of pain in her life and so we're lifting her up for healing from all those injuries that she's had lord um and you know all the injuries and you know uh, to look in her body and her life and see what to fix and how to heal, Lord. We're praying for her pain to be gone. We're praying, praying for relief in her body, Lord, that she could sit without pain and walk without pain and do the things in life that she is longing and wanting to do, Lord Jesus. We're praying that you would touch her. We're praying for healing, Lord Jesus, to Marla. And I pray that for Three Hearts Church congregation. I pray it, Lord, for my own family. I pray it for Pastor Dauber and his family. And um, I thank you, Lord Jesus, for healing Sue Rob from migraines. I pray for everyone out there, Lord, who's dealing with different sicknesses, those recovering from heart attacks, recovering from strokes, those who are dealing with diabetes. I know Pastor Dauber and Katrina are too. I pray, Lord Jesus, for those who are having pain in their back, that you will touch and heal. Pain in their feet, Lord Jesus, that you would touch their feet and take that pain and bring relief. I pray, Lord, that you would uh, relieve us in our health, Lord Jesus. All these different, even uh, from arthritis, from the different types and forms of osteoarthritis and rheumatoid arthritis and the regular you know, arthritis, the arthritis that tries to cripple our joints and bring so much pain, Lord Jesus. I pray for relief and healing to all of us in these different areas. There are way too many diseases and sicknesses now to name them all. Lord Jesus, I lift up everyone listening to this message that's seeking and believing to be healed or seeking for someone they love and know to be healed. I'm lifting them up to you, Lord Jesus, and I am praying for the healing to manifest physically in our lives. And I thank you for our spiritual healing and deliverance that you've already done for those of us who are saved. And Lord, I want to lift up Bishop David and his wife, Panina. You know him, Heavenly Father. He is your servant. 
They serve you, Lord, faithfully. He is a friend of Pastor Erustus there in Kenya. Lord, so he lost his last-born son, one year old, and he uh, had pneumonia, and he was, they were seeing him in the hospital and getting him well from that, and they discovered that uh, something was wrong with his heart. I believe his heart was swollen. They had scheduled for the surgery, Lord, and he passed away before he could make it to the surgery. Lord, your servant, Bishop David, and his family, they are really hurting. I pray, Heavenly Father, that you would please put your arms around them, Lord. Please comfort them, strengthen them. Heavenly Father, please bring peace to them, Lord. Please help them, Heavenly Father, not to be angry with you, even though such a hard thing has taken place and they're your servants. Lord, please help them to have peace with you also. And I pray, Heavenly Father, that you would heal their crushed and torn open, their broken hearts, Heavenly Father. Lord, please touch them in this time of grieving and mourning, Lord. Please bring comfort. Please strengthen them through these days, weeks, months, years ahead. Please comfort and love on them, Father. Such a crushing thing. I cannot imagine. Please comfort them, Lord. And I pray, Father, that you will please bless Three Hearts Church congregation. Please bless those who are listening to this message, Father. Please bless their lives abundantly, Father, and please pour your peace out in their lives, Lord. And I thank you, Father, for all that you're doing in and through this ministry, and I thank you for the ones that you've drawn to this ministry, Father. I pray that you would bless their lives abundantly, Father. I pray for them to have your peace, Lord. I pray for them to know you better. I pray that they would have a, a burning desire and a zeal for you and for your word, Father. And I pray a hedge of protection and a wall of fire around Three Hearts Church congregation. And I lift them up to you, Heavenly Father, and I thank you for them all, Lord. Please touch and bless their lives. And I magnify you, Heavenly Father. I love you, Heavenly Father. And I love you, Lord Jesus Christ. I pray all of these things, Heavenly Father, in the precious and holy and mighty name of Jesus Christ, I pray. Hey, you guys. I just want to take a minute to... Um, Let's go through how to pray the prayer of salvation, okay? And why? Why do we even need to pray the prayer of salvation, okay? And also, I'm talking to the people also who maybe walked with the Lord and you went away from him and you just kind of left it behind and you haven't really been walking with Jesus anymore. Um, that's what we call backsliders. I'm talking to both the person who wants to be saved for the first time ever and to the person who's a backslider who wants to come back to Jesus because this ministry does not believe in once saved, always saved. Okay, God does his part and we do our part. It's a team. We work together. All right, so the first thing is you might say, and I hear this a lot, and even my husband was saying it, to be honest with you, before we got truly saved. I'm a good person. You know, I haven't killed anybody. That's kind of the standard these days. As long as you haven't killed anybody, you're a good person. Really, listen to this. The Bible says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. That's Romans 3.23. All of us have sinned. To be honest with you, because the world is in a fallen state, we all are born into sin, okay? And also for the people that think, but I'm a good person. I'm good. I haven't hurt. I don't hurt nobody. I do good things. I help people. That, that person, then uh, there's scripture in Isaiah that says for our righteousness, that's when we're calling ourselves good and we're saying, but we're good. We're good people. Our righteousness is as filthy rags to God. That's that thing that stinks that you're like, ooh, get it out of the house, right? Filthy rags to him. Okay, and he's the standard. He's the judge, Jesus Christ. And so the thing is, if we don't, if we miss his mark and we don't please him, we're not going to make heaven. So we want to make sure we got our ducks all in a row, right? And uh, if you look at the Ten Commandments, 
Now, we're not a legalistic church. We know we're under grace, which is what Jesus Christ brought. But there's people that say, you know, like, I don't need Jesus. I'm, I'm doing the Ten Commandments. Well, if you just pull out the simplest one, I'm just going to pull out one. You shall not lie. Thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor, okay? That's what lying is. And if you say, I, oh, I don't lie, that's a lie. Everybody lies. Little kids come out lying. You say, did you do that? Did you break this? No, not me. Bam. So come on, you know. Um, so here's the thing. We've all broken uh, at least one of the commandments. And in the New Testament, it says if you break one, you broke them all. Because that's the attitude of God. He's like, if you break one, it's just as good as breaking them all. Because that's all it takes to separate you from him as one. Okay, so let's pray that prayer of salvation. It's real easy to do, y'all. You just say, Dear Jesus, please forgive me of all my sins. Please come into my heart. I believe you died on that cross for me, and I believe you rose again, and you are seated at God's right hand. Please help me to live for you all the days of my life, and thank you for saving me. In Jesus' name I pray. Now, that prayer, you prayed to Jesus in his name. The rest of them, you're going to pray to the Father in Jesus' name. Okay? And you'll get all that as you learn and grow in the Spirit. Okay? Um, to see why you needed to pray that prayer of salvation, the scripture on that is Romans 10, 9 and 10. That'll show you about confessing with your mouth and believing in your heart and, and how to obtain salvation in case you're wondering how come we're doing that, okay? Um, now, something that you're going to want to do, you want to right off the bat start establishing your relationship with Jesus, okay? And in order to do that, you want to hear his voice, right? You want to hear him. I don't know a person out there that's trying to be a Christian that doesn't want to hear his voice. And how you hear his voice Read his word. That's his words written down for you and I to read. That's his voice speaking to you without a shadow of a doubt. Okay? Then when you pray, you speak to him. So what's that? That's two-way communication. You're speaking to him. He's speaking to you. Now you've got a relationship going. Okay? And you want to do that every day. Every day, seek him. You seek him by reading his word and praying and letting him know, I want more of you. When you read the Bible... Ask him to open your spiritual eyes and your spiritual ears and to give you understanding. And he'll help you understand his word, okay? He wrote it by Holy Spirit, okay? And the next thing that you're going to want to do is get in a good Bible-based church. Now, I'm not pushing any kind of denomination. You just want to find a church that is preaching and teaching the whole Bible, Okay, they believe in the Bible and they believe in Jesus Christ, that he is God and the Son of God, okay? And that it's through him that we have our redemption and our salvation. He's the way, the truth, and the life, okay? And also, um, I wanted to say that some people think, oh, I just pray for forgiveness one time and I'm done because he died way back when, so now that I ask, it's all already done. No. You need to ask forgiveness and try to make it a habit on a daily basis because we're in these fleshly bodies before we get our glorified bodies, so we battle this flesh daily. So just, you know, when you pray each day, at some point during the day, say, Lord, please forgive me for all my sins and go on about your prayer. And he knows you're praying and you're talking to him from your heart. And you talk to him just like you and I would talk, okay? You don't have to have fancy whatever, all right? And ask him to help you grow spiritually. If you want to, let us know that you prayed that prayer. It would be such a blessing to hear your testimony, okay? God bless y'all.